It's a common conception that the land in which we live and the animals that surround are separate entities. In reality, the Earth and all living beings who inhabit it are entirely dependent upon the survival of each other. The essence of kindness, a collective effort. A healthy, functioning ecosystem will sustain itself. Within an ecological balance of pinpoint accuracy, the environmental, geological, hydrological and botanical needs of maintenance will be met. Those who ensure this upkeep are known as keystone species. Keystone species are fundamental aspects to the ecosystem by the power they possess and ability to make change. Animals who with a collective decision, could change the earth as we know it. In old times, these would have been the tiger, the shark, the horse, or the goat. Today, it's us. A fundamental element of the eco-balance is a balanced number of predator to prey species. Enough prey to feed the predators and enough predators to ensure there won't be too many prey. The behaviour of prey mammals, such as roe deer, can be altered by the presence of predator animals. A collective of deer, grazing upon the razor-thin blades of grass by the bank of the River Wye, a deep valley in which sits the ancient forest of Dean. If we were to go back 500 years, these native deer would not be grazing on the riverbanks, as the banks would be flat and the water would be spilling upon the land. Wolves would be just a runaway for them. Perhaps a buzzard may scare them back off into the woods, but for now, they seem to view the birds as a child does their favourite toy. There were once great animals who roamed the land. Go back 2,000 years to find the Eurasian brown bear standing on its back legs at a height of 2 metres 20. They were gone once the Romans arrived. 300 years is how long back you'd have to travel in order to see the last remaining wild Eurasian grey wolf in Britain. Their culling was the result of thousands of farmers who suddenly needed their livestock taken care of. Livelihoods that depend upon the absolutely and utterly merciless killing of wild dogs. There are still wild dogs about today though. Volpes Volpes, the red fox. Their profile will be familiar to you. Foxes only survived when wolves didn't due to their cat-like ability to become scarce at an instant. The wolves and bears couldn't hide. Canines aside, perhaps the most detrimental to the long-term health of the people was the culling of wild cats. The Eurasian lynx was once common in Britain and with a shoulder height of 75 centimetres, it hunted until the sun came up. The lynx was a keystone species that kept in check the population and ground coverage of rodents. Mice, rats, squirrels, and so on. Today, these apex predators are only known to the Far East. Throughout history, we have portrayed our fear and complete lack of understanding of death and decay when it is the single most important function within any ecosystem. The cycle of life begins with the ground. Plants are native experts at extracting every nutrient, metal and chemical possible from below. Acting as a natural biofilter, the roots of plants decide exactly what they uptake. The minerals and vitamins are taken up into the tissue of these plants and eaten by herbivores.
As the elements of life are passed from earth to plant to animal, there are two options for the pathway of biomass. Either said herbivore is hunted, killed, and eaten by a prey species, or dies of natural causes. Within the latter scenario is where the nutrient and energy process comes full circle. When a large mammal lies dead upon the forest floor, a sixth sense arrhythmia occurs. Blowflies gather within the flesh, earthworms burrow, fungi grows internally. The compounds once responsible for maintaining the life and soul of this Eurasian wild boar are now shared amongst the community in the most democratic and fair manner possible. It is the job of microorganisms to break down the body and return it back into the earth from which new plants will grow to feed the next generation. Without death, there is no life. The Anthropocene can be defined as the period in which human beings conquered the natural world and took complete influence upon it. The impact of human beings on the British ecosystem can be seen with closed eyes. We arrive upon a system which has been self-sustaining for millions of years, tear it all down and hang up a wooden box for the birds to call home. It is not sustainable. Although inaccessible and mundane to us, the wetlands within periodic floodplains are the most important habitats within the country. All life needs still water to drink, bathe, breed and cool. This, unfortunately for the wildlife, was not ideal for farmers. The 1600s led to the mass drainage of wetlands. Artificial levees built, concrete dams, fake river courses and raised banks to keep the water away from the land. In nature, there is no defined riverbank. These lands, whose inhabitants greatly depend upon the annual flooding, were drained, flattened, and pumped full of chemical fertilizers. The land dried out, the animals left, and we abused the land for its nutrients. It's this man-made altering of the waterways that causes the severe flooding and droughts that are commonplace now. The effects of over-fertilisation, lack of field rotation and the sheer volume of chemical poisoning can be seen with the naked eye within our waterways. Discoloration, thick bubbles, oils, acidic water, excess CO2 and an abundance of toxic heavy metals are now present in the water. These pollutants are injected into the ground and due to our ancestors and their alteration of the watercourses find their way into concentrated areas of fast-flowing narrow rivers. This only aids in the distribution of toxic chemicals that enters the nutrient cycle at a greater amount every single day. A cumulative culmination of poison. Chemical pollution aside, one of the most overlooked forms of human interference is light pollution. Artificial lights in the form of street lamps, cars, homes, aeroplanes and towers have a profound effect on the ecology around us. In his book, How to See Nature, Paul Evans writes, safety, the reduction of traffic accidents and crime, is the justification for the human colonization of the night. The lesser horseshoe bat is the smallest flying mammal native to Britain. They sleep in dark caves during the daytime and forage for vegetation by night. A strong requirement of theirs is that they have access to connecting corridors of darkness. These bats, along with other flying nocturnal animals, use the availability of light to interpret and make sense of the world around them. When bats are navigating, they like to keep the moon in one corner of their eye to ensure an efficient flight path. With the introduction of artificial lighting, hunting is difficult and nighttime navigation is near impossible. A phenomenon this leads to is one in which street lights act as if magnetic to flying insects, all drawn to what their ancient brains tell them is the moon. With these hotspots of photosensitive insects comes prey species ready to take advantage of the hunting opportunity. 
It was estimated by Paul Evans that one third of flying insects die as a direct result to their encounter with artificial light. This example of altered behaviour can be used to demonstrate the severity and seriousness of our actions. Due to its unique location on the south end of the Welsh English border, the Forest of Dean is one of the few great woodlands left largely alone by mankind. The result of this is a near perfect habitat for a mass of bioactivity. Within the forest live deer, foxes, wild boar, and a cacophony of birds. A severe problem within the majority of biospheres is that with a lack of wild mammals, plant seed distribution is limited. It is upon the fur of the mammal that sticky seeds cling, are transported and deposited elsewhere. Deer will eat berries containing seeds and defecate elsewhere, leaving a gift of seed wrapped in natural fertilizer. The process of seed germination requires two things, warmth and moisture. Seeds have a phenomenal ability to lie dormant for an unmeasurable amount of time when these conditions are not met. This is where the boar comes in. As part of their foraging strategy, boar use their powerful snouts to dredge up the forest floor, turning over soil and, in the process, exposing seeds to new conditions. Where it may have previously been too deep down, too cold or too wet, a second chance is given. It has been observed throughout history that there is a symbiotic relationship between small birds and boar, specifically robins. The terraforming of the land is what uncovers a whole feast of food for the robin. Earthworms, beetles, ants and spiders, anything without a spine is fair game. It is the dead wood becoming horizontal that turns dead trees into bustling polycultures. As trees near the end of their life cycle, weighty mammals are needed to grind against, rub down and break apart trunks. When settled down in an untouched environment, the community will almost always construct their own village, a collective effort of digging and displacing land in effort to dig bathing pits, construct nests and create pathways. They have a system completely independent from us. What this leads to is the curing of drought. In the forest of Dean, the ground is rarely level. The limestone rocks paired with ancient glacial erosion make most areas either uphill or downhill. These steep slopes mean that water runoff is a serious problem, collecting in the bottom of valleys, leaving the higher woodlands parched. The boar solve this problem by carving embankments and ridges into the landscape, sometimes taking years and multiple generations. What seems to be a simple puddle is a feat of geoengineering. With a dependent water pooling area, new life can spring. New plants, new wetland species, amphibians, all sorts of insects, thus adding to the ecosystem of ecological contributions. Wild boar were classed as extinct in the UK around 400 years ago, with numbers being easily countable since the 14th century. It was only in 1987 when a group of farmed boar escaped captivity after a brutal storm and reclaimed their natural home in the forest. Boar, however, are not the only keystone species to make a dramatic comeback. By the 16th century, the population of Eurasian beaver within the British Isles hit zero. The land soon began to suffer. It's difficult to convey just how much beavers are responsible for the shape of the land that we learn to be the norm. With their waterproof fur, valuable chemical secretions and dense meat, they're an easy target for hunters and merchants of the 1500s. The eradication of the beaver within the UK lines up quite dramatically with the rampant increase in agricultural terraforming. Beavers eat bark, 
tree bark. They use their iron-cladded incisor teeth to strip the surface of the wood, and remarkably, they are able to sustain themselves from this. After felling the closest trees, carving the stumps in a sharpened pencil shape, they carry branches one by one to their nests in a similar fashion to the leafcutter ant. Beavers are terrible at walking, but they are fantastic at swimming. It's this reason that every Eurasian beaver is born with the instinct to increase the water coverage and flooding of the woodlands. If they can swim to their food, they can stay safe from predators. The instant a beaver hears the sound of running water, an insatiable desire comes across them to stop it. This is where the dam comes in. Using sticks, rocks and lots of mud, arguably the most intricate and beautiful of all bioengineering takes place. The dams act as a defensive fortress, but more importantly, they hold back water and create a slow flowing waterway. Not only is this good for hydrating the land, but the introduction of stagnant water allows for an assembly of water-dwelling species, such as flies, mosquitoes, frogs, worms, isopods, fish, and wading marsh birds, such as the grey heron. These beaver dams can be a possible solution to the toxification of Britain's waterways. In a similar fashion to the natural filtering of plant roots, the biomass enclosed within a beaver dam can act as a wildly efficient biofilter, trapping heavy metals and toxic elements while still allowing for the movement of fish. Within the forest of Dean, there only live two beavers, an enclosed trial project. What we have today is a select area in which the government have been convinced to watch and learn just how much effect beavers truly have on the landscape. If these trials go well, we could one day see wild Eurasian beavers across Britain. What's undeniable is that there is no native land without native species. These are their breeding grounds. We must save them. <laughs>